The Lord be with you. Good morning, friends. Welcome. Today our liturgy is in the red book in your pew. And if you haven't got one, these are scattered around the worship space. They're uh, just pew cards. They direct you to where we should be in the book at various times. I also will make those announcements so you don't have to, don't have to worry too much. Um, the flowers in our chancel today are from uh, Sam's funeral and um, we uh, celebrated on Friday and uh, of course we keep uh, his family in our prayers today as well. I have a few announcements and that is that um, on February 25th we have our annual meeting and uh, the deadline for getting reports into I forget who Bridget Susan, Susan. Uh, will be on the 3rd of February, so thank you very much. Um, and also I want to say that for a number of months now, we've been hosting our worship service on the first Sunday of each month at 4 p.m. Uh, the worship committee has decided to cease that practice, so our worship will be at 10 a.m. every Sunday except for the first Sunday in February. It doesn't go into effect then. So um, uh, just a reminder, and I'll bring this up a few more times, we're just changing our schedule again to be every Sunday morning. Um, are there any other announcements? I believe, Selena, you have one. Thank you. Well, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pull the mic to you. Okay. I got an email and it says, Dear Selena, you are sneaky, but I saw Redeemer's email this morning. We are both moved that you were planning this for us and you truly are an amazing friend and person. We love you so much. Now the bad news, the racial justice seminar at Redeemer is about to be postponed. Uh, Jerry is having surgery and she, Sheila Hamilton is in Florida. And so him and Pat, Steve couldn't do it alone, so it's been postponed to March 23rd. So I told him, I am so disappointed, all the party stuff we wanted to do, it's all gone. We were planning a surprise party for Steve, because him and Antonio got married, um, when was that? In December. December. December I was yeah. there, I was only there. Like, and um, for a Friday, our family at Redeemer, an amazing, amazing group of people. I left and I got an email before I got home on Friday that the church was clean <laughs> and everything was washed and put away. And I was so happy because I thought I have to come back with Ruth and help. But look, it's all done. Thank you, everybody that stayed back. Thank you. Thanks, Selena. We will um, update you on the Racial Justice Seminar um, as we get closer uh, to that. Um, if there are no more announcements, can I ask um, John Paul if you would offer our land acknowledgement, please? Redeemer is bordered on the east side of our lot by Indian Road. This street name is a reminder of two things. One, that indigenous peoples who resided here used this as a trading route, and two, as the vague street name indicates, the settler society of which we are a part has historically had little interest in the lives of the indigenous people who share this land with us. As a small sign of Redeemer's desire to bring ourselves and our society into right relations with our indigenous brothers and sisters, we be begin today by acknowledging that we worship and gather on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Wendat. We acknowledge them and any other nations who care for the land as the past, present, and future caretakers of this place.
Let us prepare for worship with confession and forgiveness, and you will find that on page 94 of your hymnal. Page 94. Please rise. We worship as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in our gathering song, which you will find on your um, handout. Faith begins by letting go. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us join together in our Kyrie, which is on page 184.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into Christ's healing presence. Bring new life to all that is broken and speak truth to all that is confused, that creation will see and know your peace. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is taken from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 20. I don't think it was working. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Harab on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I, shall will, I, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let's sing together Psalm 111. <laughs>
Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and the disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. Just then there was in, a, in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked the spirit, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, Grace to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. When I prepare a sermon, I always read the gospel text first. You don't have to. You can have an idea that you think speaks to the world or speaks to your congregation or speaks to you, and then you uh, do research and you draw together all sorts of scriptures and you present that. It's a completely honorable way to create a sermon. The reason I do it the other way is because I work well in situations where there's limitation and structure. When I'm given a lesson, I want to find out, one, how does this lesson speak to our modern circumstance? Or I try to think, okay, what do we need in terms of sort of modern cultural anthropology or scientific understanding to understand the scripture. So one or the other, there's a conversation happening. But this presents a problem because today's scripture is problematic. And I almost preached on another passage. And I thought, no, I need to constrain myself. So here we are. <laughs> May I just read this again? Just then they were in the synagogue and a man with an unclean spirit cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked the spirit and said, come out of him and convulsing and crying with a loud spirit, with a loud uh, voice, the spirit came out. So, in my 30 years as a pastor, I have experienced maybe four events that I can only understand as some sort of external energy or spirit or something like that, and only one, um, I think for sure. The rest, maybe not. And let me put this in context. Lutheran pastors gather, we gather every year at the annual uh, clergy retreat in Niagara Falls, at each national convention of the uh, National Church. We room together, we drink scotch together, we let down our walls, and in 30 years, I bet I've heard three, maybe four stories that match this gospel of Mark about an experience in which someone no longer had the tools to understand what had happened. We're women and men who walk through the darkest valleys of human experience. We encourage. We cajole, we engage, we challenge. Why do we not talk about the spirit world? 
Well, we do talk about the spirit world. We talk about it endlessly. But we talk about the ways in which the world of the spirit intersects the world of matter. We talk about loss. We talk about mourning and life celebrations. We talk about becoming fully human. We talk about life and death, growth. We talk about the spiritual side of life all the time. Why do we not talk about spirits and demons? Well, I think it's because one needs to be a little cautious about certain things. Paul says in Romans 14, for this reason we must make up our minds not to do anything that will cause another to stumble. Now I'm caught because I've got the gospel pushing me in one direction and I've got Paul on the other side. What I'm gonna to try to do is address the gospel without causing any of you to stumble. What allows me to go forward is that I'm pretty sure that there is not a single person in this room who does not have some experience of the darker side of the spirit life. We are all here on earth. We have to deal with it. It's something. The only authentic exorcism that I have experienced happened to a young man, otherwise happy, who experienced a force against his chest that would just drop him to the ground. He felt the weight of a thousand pounds upon him. Those are his words from under which he could not get out. The second and third events that I've experienced were all part of an extended event. And they were about 20 years of disturbance that was occurring in a parish with no understandable reason. So the right of healing, which is the Roman Catholic rite of exorcism within the Lutheran mass was used and it was efficacious in changing the space. We're not talking people here, but space. The fourth event I encountered dealt with a house that kept filling with smoke, even to the point of calling firefighters and emergency personnel who were stumped at why this kept happening. So I need to say right now that these are personal experiences and they're descriptions and they're purposely vague and they're not science, right? We know that. I'm aware that my own prejudices inform my understanding of such events, and I know that I skew them in the way I want to. I don't do it intentionally, but I know that it's just part of being human. Um, in the Catholic Rite of 1614, updated only once in 1999, there are two liturgies. There's one, which is the liturgy of exorcism for an individual or for a spirit in an individual, and exorcism of a space. They don't say the word exorcism anymore. It's all called the rituals of healing. And you can understand why it softens the edges a little bit. And that's important because if you actually walk through those rites, they're very, very gentle rites. The language is soft. There's nothing like you see on the movies, yelling and all that sort of stuff. What you're really trying to do is to shift the energy, either in a person or a place, such that whatever is hanging on can relinquish. And so you say stuff like, you are released to God. It's all lovely stuff. And it's not by any stretch of the imagination, um, unique to Christianity. Every major world religion has rituals and liturgies for dealing with spirit encounters. The Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is a Buddhist writing, is an absolutely fascinating read. It's very small. It's a line-by-line -line set of instructions 
that you whisper into the word of a person. Now, this is important, a person who has never had any religious training in their lives. So that they can dodge and, manip and, and walk around both the malevolent spirits and the beneficent spirits on the path to nirvana or new life on the other side of death. In the book of Ashita, which is a Hindu writing from the same time as the Book of the Dead, you read, and this is really, really interesting to me, that the spirits will inhabit your mind until you let them go. I cannot emphasize how important this is. Vashita, a sage from the 8th century, says that the power of perceiving spirits and engaging them is completely within our realm of choice. Don't forget your own power. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled, do not be afraid, for I am with you. We always have the power of life over death. That's just the way things work. So, to write this sermon, I looked at all sorts of exorcisms on the internet. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> I don't recommend it. I just don't recommend it. So much is made up and it's sleight of hand and stupidity that you can just disregard it. Most of it is for show, right? It's entertainment. It's trying to engage some YouTube numbers or something like that. No, 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 you don't need to go there. Um, I know that in the literature, in the Roman Catholic literature, 99.9% .9 of all reportings of an indwelling spirit fail to hit the requirements in the liturgy for healing, in the liturgy for exorcism. Most exorcists, and there are people designated with this role, spend their time <laughs> talking people out of exorcism because it's just not what's happening. Um, and it's also true that in the actual uh, rubrics of the liturgy are um, indications that this liturgy must not proceed until all medical resources, psychological resources, psychiatry, have been ruled out as possible avenues of healing. It's not a game, right? And it happens very, very rarely. Psychology now has a whole set of secular exorcists that engage from a scientific, secular, psychological point of view in what they see as a fundamental element of human existence, and that is that we are spiritual beings, even if we don't think of God or call God God or have any sort of understanding of that, we still, you know, our heart trembles at a sunrise. Um, uh, we smile at a, a child's play. There's something in us that is touching, that is touched by and in relationship with this world underneath all of our words and our actions. So there is a spirit world however you want to identify it. Um, what I'm interested in is how people who have some sort of a, like a meditation pattern or a life of prayer, and I mean one that's fairly consistent, um, although, you know, we're all, we all are ordinary people. We, uh, we pray when we're in an urgent situation because that's what we do, right? That's, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But there seems to be a way for meditators and people who pray consistently to clear their mind of negative forces. And I think my conclusion in all of this little journey this week is that it is the job of the spiritual journey to overcome fear. Most of us will never encounter anything like an exorcism or the need for one. And 
almost all bumps in the night are just that. They're shifting houses, they're wind, they're our imaginations. But for those who do encounter a negative or demonic force, it is an encounter that can be mind-numbingly filled with fear. Now, we all have fears. Again, it is the job of the spiritual journey to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to overcome fear itself. You got one job. Because unbelief is not the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Would you join me please in our hymn, which is O Living Breath of God, number 407. As we celebrate Christ among us, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation, saying, God of grace, and responding, receive our prayer. Loving God, for teachers, healers, and those who share their wisdom, we give you thanks. God of grace, receive, receive our prayer. prayer. Renewing God, creation groans in sorrow. May we be agents of reconciliation with the earth, that waterways flow clean and clear, natural spaces thrive, and our planet is healed. God of grace, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Justice-seeking God, we pray for those in government, that they lead with mindfulness, 
May Israel and Palestine find an agreement that provides land for all, and may attacks against civilian targets cease. May Russia stop its aggression toward Ukraine, and may world governments aid Libya in this time of catastrophic flooding. God of grace, receive our prayer. Compassionate God, we pray for all in need, especially those who experience rejection, all who struggle with long-term illness and chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care, and those who suffer. Especially we pray for the family of Sam Kelowan, who mourns his death with us. God of grace, receive our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer our prayers, trusting in Christ's mercy and love. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace together. Peace, everybody, from Ingrid. Everyone on the computer and in the congregation. Thank you. Peace to all from Ruta. And Al. Peace from Charmaine as well. Peace to everyone. Peace, Charmaine. Peace, Al. Ruta. Peace, Peace Ingrid. Charmaine. Peace, Al. and Ruta. Peace, goes right in the middle. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, loving God, in the name of Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to the nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your own. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with the, church of angel, with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, which is Holy, Holy, Holy on page 190. <laughs>
In the night in which she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to eat, saying, take this, all of you. This is my body given for you. As often as you share this with one another, remember me. So too, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant for you and for all people. As often as you share this with one another, remember me. And now as often as we eat this bread and share this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. God of abundance, with this bread of life and this cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is 876, Let the Whole Creation Cry. 867. <laughs> it's 876, right? I, I take no responsibility for this. Note, you may have noticed coming in this morning that some good-hearted but misguided individual placed about 60 containers of mushrooms in the pantry. Uh, they will not last long. They're in good shape now. If you like mushrooms, take a couple, cook with them, but we're going to dispose of them because they're just going to rot out there. Fresh mushrooms. Yeah. Outside on there, stacked in there. Nice to see all of you, Charmaine, Pastor Al, Ruta. 
and Ingrid Lester. God bless Irene and Charmaine and Ingrid and Pastor Ruta and Al. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you two, Ruth and Christine. Hi, everybody. We have a blessing. Yeah, it's true. Bye, Ingrid. Have a good week. See you, Al Ruta.